morning and welcome to Cedardale. We're so, so pleased to have you joining us this morning. We have so many things going on here at the church. You must check out the bulletin that comes out to those on our uh, list. If you want to receive it, you can contact us through the website or in the comments below and we will add you to our email list. You also will be aware that we have a Spanish congregation, very small, but uh, we just love to have our Spanish people here. And Pilar will be on right now to invite our Spanish speakers to come and join us. So here's Pilar. Días y bienvenidos a la iglesia de Cidadale en Pefferlo. Queremos informarles que tenemos un servicio en español los domingos a las 12 de la, de la tarde. Están bienvenidos todos. Oren por esta iglesia y esperamos verlos muy pronto. Que Dios los bendiga. Thank you, Pilar. Now we are going to be having a guest speaker this morning, Dr. Ken Burton, in person. So in the meantime, you will be watching a video from our district superintendent, Reverend Steve Otley, and it's a marvelous message and one I think you will find very encouraging. So please uh, stay tuned and listen to Pastor Steve. We also have, coming up the following week on the 26th, Creation Ministries, and Mr. Jim Hughes from Creation Ministries will be joining us then, and he has a great opportunity for you to learn some of the scientific facts behind evolution and creation and to find out how you can defend your stand for the gospel truth about creation. And he's willing to have a nice question and answer period afterward where you can challenge him and ask questions and get more information. So please do stay tuned for that. And Creation Ministries has been very generous in giving us a short video to play on that week when uh, Mr. Hughes is here presenting to us in person. But it's an exciting, exciting presentation, so don't miss it. So we'll get back to this week and we will have Dr. Uh, Reverend Steve Otley come now and bring us today's message. If I've ever had that kind of welcome, <laughs> don't make my head so big now. <laughs> uh, it is, uh, it's good to be with you. Good morning to you. And uh, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, it is such a privilege for, for me to be here. Pat and I, it's good to have my wife with me. Yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, you feel the love, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's, Pat and I count it an honor and a privilege for us to, uh, to travel across our district and to worship in our churches across the district. And so I bring you greetings. We bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in uh, other Nazarene churches across Ontario. There are 57 of us. You're not alone. There are 57 Nazarene churches across Ontario. And, uh, and uh, together, we, uh, we do better when we do things together. And we are just a slice of the pie of the Christian church. Amen. And so uh, we are not alone in the mission that we carry out together in making Christ like disciples. Pastor Grant and Karen, where's Karen? She she probably yes. oh, with down the, yeah. it, it's so good to be with you. Love and appreciate you both. And uh, thank you for, for your leadership here at Cedardale. 11 years, right? I was, I was looking at my mm -hmm. records and uh, 11 years that you have been leading and it's so it's so good to be with you. Um, hey, boy, I, the kids, they just bless me. Wherever I go and I see kids, it tells me that the church has a future, 
right? And, and, and when they started singing in Spanish, it's like, <laughs> wow. Um, and uh, I got to meet uh, your, your new friends from Mexico. And uh, yeah, Mexico. And uh, I told them, I told them we're from Belize, which is just below Mexico. So we are neighbors. And they say, can you speak Spanish? I go, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, kid, the kids outdid me and my wife outdid me. But yo uh, un poquito. That's it. That's my knowledge. <laughs> uh, I, I, I feel bad. We have... I believe 11 Spanish churches on the district mm -hmm. and whenever I go um, you know I have to have a translator and I go man Lord give me the gift of tongues <laughs> <laughs> I speak in Spanish you know um, but it is it is so good welcome to uh, to Canada welcome to Cedardale Church and the Church of the Nazarene and uh, it's so good to meet you all right um, it, as, as you were uh, sharing with us about uh, Ukraine, and uh, in particular, but also about Turkey and, and um, Syria, I was thinking about the fact that uh, you mentioned about Ukrainians coming to Canada. You may or may not know that um, on the district, we are hosting uh, a Ukrainian refugee family, our Rosewood Church. Uh, has a, uh, a refugee family that they have sponsored and that they are here. It's a husband and wife and their three kids. It's a Nazarene pastor um, who, uh, who was a church planter in Ukraine. And so they came back in October, I believe it was. And so Rosewood has been, uh, they've, they've got a place for them to live and they're meeting all of their financial needs for that family. So we thank God for, for them. Pray for, for the family, pray for Rosewood as they try to uh, help this family to integrate into the Canadian life. And then um, uh, our, our uh, Windsor Church, Pastor John Naposlin and our Windsor Church, they are in the process of sponsoring and they've raised all the funds with help from uh, Nazarene churches in Michigan as well, they've raised all the funds to bring a family of 10 wow. from Afghanistan. Well, actually they're in Pakistan, but originally from Afghanistan. And uh, they're, they're hoping, praying that that family will arrive in Canada in the spring. So pray for them. They've raised, I think, about $200,000 uh, with, with uh, the partnership with the churches in Michigan. It was a church in Michigan that started the process, but it was easier for them to come to Canada than to go to the U.S. And so they've partnered with our Windsor Church and uh, they've made it possible. So pray for them. And then, uh, I wasn't planning all of this, but you just prompted me with, with the missions uh, moment there. Um, and then we were contacted by our Nazarene Discipleship International um, uh, director uh, in Kansas City to let us know that um, there was five families from Afghanistan uh, this was back in the fall of last year they said they are arriving in Toronto tomorrow <laughs> like back then tomorrow so they have been here the gov they're, they're uh, government sponsored it's not sponsored by a church and so the government is uh, is footing the bill for them for a year. To they were in hotels near the airport. They have started finding uh, apartments now, and we've been working with uh, different people and churches to try to help to furnish their apartments. So be praying for 22 22 people uh, from Afghanistan. Be praying for them as we work with these different people who are coming from uh, just hellish conditions uh, that are man-made um, and so pray for all of uh, what God is uh, doing through us and, uh, and with us in these circumstances. Well, let me get to where I was going to go <laughs> this morning. Um, you know, I I've been blessed uh, to be in partnership with my wife. This year will be 40 years. Wow. 30, 
31 of those in pastoral ministry. When she married me, she, the, the part of the deal wasn't that I was going to be a pastor. <laughs> so it was uh, well into our marriage where we sensed the call of God into pastoral ministry. And uh, I could tell you about that journey another time. But Pastor Grant, did I ever tell you about how Pat, well, the very first time that I laid eyes on my wife? No, I never told you that story. Well, I, I was, I told you, we're from Belize. And so I was hanging out with my friends on Freetown Road in Belize City. And uh, we were right across from Belize Technical College. And, and this young angel, <laughs> brownie points, you know. <laughs> this young angel, I, I spotted her walking up the street, across the road, right in front of the school, and I turn to my friend Carl and I go, who is that? And he goes, I mean, she is just a picture of perfection. Right? And um, I, I, I said, Carl, I go, like, who is that? And, and he said, this was his answer, that is Barney Longsworth's daughter. And that shut me down. <laughs> Barney Longsworth was a teacher at the high school who, in my mind, was wealthy to me. He looked like Fidel Castro <laughs> at the time. He had this beard and all that. So it was like, oh, man. But to make a long story short, Pat invited me out on a date. No. <laughs> Actually, she was the one who, uh, who pursued me. Um, and, 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 but it was a mutual thing, and, and that, was, that was actually 47 years ago. And, and seven years after that, we got married. And uh, yeah, we got married pretty young, you can tell, right? Yeah, you think, 47? Yeah, anyway. Uh, um, that, that's how I met my wife, uh, for the, laid eyes on her for the very first time. And I said it was a, a picture of perfection. In fact, I carry on my phone, I carry on my phone this, you can tell I need these brownie points, but I, I carry on my phone this beautiful portrait of, of my wife. So everywhere I go, I, 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 can, I can see her, I can pull it out and, and see her, right? And so uh, you go, where are you going with all of that? It's okay, yeah. Well, today I want to bring our attention to a question that I've asked myself. I've asked myself, and I, I want to ask us here this morning. What does a portrait, speaking of portrait, what does a portrait of commitment to God look like? What does that look like? What does it mean to be totally committed to to God, and, and and if we're if we're going to put a dent in being effective in reaching the 15 million people in Ontario with the love of Christ, we need to be a group of people, not just us at Cedardale, and not just us in the Canada Central District Church of the Nazarene, but Christians across this province. We need to be a group of people. Who are sold out to Jesus, who are fully committed to Christ and fully committed to the mission that he has given to us. And so the, the question that often comes to my mind is, what does that look like? How, how does it look to be a portrait of commitment? Well, uh, I believe that the great commandment is what that looks like. Verbally, like the word picture of what a, a perfect portrait of commitment looks like. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God and loving people. But, but how does that look in a practical way? Not just words, but... In the way that we, that I, that you live our lives. What does that look like? Well, I, I, I find an interesting story that shows us a portrait 
of commitment in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 12, if you've been around the, the church for a long time, you know this story as soon as I get to it. But before I get to the actual story, let me give you a little bit of context about what's happening uh, at this time uh, in the life of Jesus. In chapter 11 of Mark, uh, this is where we read about the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. So we're talking about Holy Week. Uh, on Palm Sunday, Jesus comes in in this triumphant uh, entry into Jerusalem with the palm branches being waved and Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, and, and then uh, that same week is just to give you a context of what's happening. That same week in chapter 11, it talks about Jesus clearing the temple. Remember that story where he came into the temple and he saw that they were selling, uh, there were, it was, it had become a marketplace in the temple and, and Jesus cleared it out saying, my, my father's house is a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. It wasn't necessarily about the fact that they were selling in the temple because people who were coming to make sacrifice, it was the Old Testament, and they were making sacrifice to God, they would purchase an animal in the courts of the temple to sacrifice. And so it wasn't about that, but it was about the people who were selling, were making it, um, they were stealing from poor people. They were overcharging them. Those who were coming from other countries as they changed their monies to, uh, to whatever uh, money they would need to purchase in the temple, they would cheat them. So Jesus was saying, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's been made a den of thieves, and so he cleared the temple. So this triumphant entry, he clears the temple, and, and then we get into chapter 12, and this is where uh, some of the rulers came to Jesus trying to trap him, and they ask him, um, you know, do, do we, should we be paying taxes to Caesar? And they knew that if he said yes, that the people would be mad at him. If he said no, then Caesar would be mad at him. So it was a trap, and Jesus recognized that, and he says to them, you're trying to trap me, but he says, give me a coin, and he, he gets the coin, and he says, whose picture is on this coin? And it's a picture of Caesar. And he says, give to Caesar what belongs to him. Give to God what belongs to him, meaning yourself. And, and, and so that's where this takes place. And then in chapter 12 again, is the great commandment, where he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he says to them what we just talked about, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So this, these are the things that are happening here. And, and it is within that context that in fact the, same, the very same day that this passage takes place in the temple. It is Mark chapter 12 starting at verse, one to, or verse 41 to 44. And here is what happens. It says, Jesus sat down near the collection box. I guess it's right there. So he sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in a large amount. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live by. Wow. What a, what a portrait of commitment we see in this widow. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this widow. Widow, this widow was committed to God, so committed to God that she gave everything that she had, not just a portion, but she gave everything that she had. And, and, and for, for Jesus, giving of our resources is actually a spiritual matter. It, it's not about 
it's not about the resources that we have, but it's, it's a spiritual matter. And, and, and that's where I want to dwell on uh, in the remaining time that we have. It was important enough for Jesus to sit in the temple and, and watch as people were giving their offerings. And then he used what took place there as a teaching opportunity for his disciples. And later in their ministry, the disciples took that lesson to heart. And every single one of them, save Judas, all of them were so totally committed to God and sold out to God that their very lives were taken because of their commitment to Jesus. And, and, and so Jesus used this opportunity. I, I, I want us to use this opportunity for this, this lesson, this story, very well known to most of us as a teaching opportunity this morning about what does it look like to be a portrait of commitment to God. I would, uh, I would step out on a limb here this morning to say that this widow's offering you know, that, that she gave was just a snapshot of how she lived all of her life. It wasn't just about the financial resources that she gave, but it was about her entire life. And, and there are so many different aspects of life that show how committed we are. And I know that uh, Billy Pastor Grant has been preaching on some of this already. And I, I just want to kind of bring things together as I've been thinking about uh, what does it look like to be a portrait of commitment. But there are all different kinds of ways, uh, areas of our lives that we can show commitment to God. But generally they could be summed up in, in three areas. Our, our time, our talent, and our treasures. The three T's. Our time, our talents, and our treasures. Our time. What, what do we do with the time that God has granted to us? What do we do with the, how do we use the gifts, the talents, the spiritual gifts, natural abilities, spiritual gifts that God has blessed us with? And, and how do we use our treasure? How do we use our financial resources uh, that God has entrusted to me and, and to you? Um, you know, I can say, I can say all I want to say about how much I love God and how much I love people. I can say that verbally, but until it's like, show me the love, right? You know, show me the money, show me the love, until I show uh, tangibly the love for God and the love for people, my words are just a clanging symbol, right? And, and I, I, can, I can tell my wife verbally how much I love her. Honey, I love you every day. I could say that to her, but if I don't tangibly show that to her as well, my, my words mean nothing. And, and, and so how, how do we take what, what, what God has blessed us with and, and show our commitment and love for God? So there are a few questions that I want to ask us today, ask myself and ask you, that I believe will help us to examine our commitment to God. And please, I'm not preaching at you. I'm, I'm, these are questions I ask myself, questions that I use to uh, examine my own life and my own commitment to God. So here's spiritual question number one. And maybe, Pastor Grant, maybe you covered this already, but if you have, it's a reminder. Spiritual question number one. If God were to look at my calendar, would he say, there is a committed child. Of mine. In other words, how, how am I using my time? So let me let me put it to you this way: if 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 there was a bank, a financial institution, that um, that credited your account, your bank account, every single morning, they credited your account. $86,400 every single morning that amount was going in your bank account but at the end of the day whatever was left in there would be taken out what would you do all that day 
you find ways to spend that eighty-four, eighty-six thousand four hundred dollars, right? You, you you can't you can't borrow from tomorrow, and, and you can't take over from today into tomorrow. It would be take you would you would figure out ways to spend that eighty-six thousand four hundred dollars. Well, there is such a bank, but it's not money; it's time. Every single day. You and I have 86,400 seconds. The question is, how do we invest that? What, 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 what do we do with that time? What, what do we do with the time that God has given to us? A am I using it selfishly? Am I wasting it? Or am I investing it in people? Am I investing it in the purpose for which God has created me. You know, I, I want to be like the Apostle Paul, who at the end of his life, he was able to say, I was not disobedient to the vision from God. The Apostle Paul, after his conversion, had a vision from God that God would use him to reach the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles. And at the end of his life, Paul was able to say, I was not disobedient. I, I did exactly what God called me to do. I spent my time on purpose reaching, sharing the good news, the gospel of Jesus with the Gentiles. And so, and so if God were to look at my calendar, and I, I'm pretty, I, I, I tell people I'm not, um, I'm not disciplined enough not to have a structured calendar. Everything I need to do goes in my calendar. This, this is my brain. And, but if, if God... It, that's, maybe I shouldn't have said it that way. But anyway, um, you know, if God were to look at my calendar, what, what kind of commitment would he see in my calendar? Okay, how about, how about my talent? My, my abilities, my, the spiritual gifts that he has blessed me with. If God were to look at what I do with those talents and that he has blessed me with, would he say, man, there is a committed child of mine. We only need to go to 1 Corinthians to see the importance of the spiritual gifts that God has given us. That God has said that he has given to every single person who has placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He blesses us with spiritual gifts. And, 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 and the question is, how am I using those gifts, those talents that God has given to me? Again, if we're going to put a dent in making a difference in the lives of the 15 million people in Ontario, we all need to use our spiritual gifts for the purpose of the mission of Christ. That includes using what we have in our hands. Whatever it is, whatever ability that God has given to you and to me, we need to use it to see the vision of realizing the transformation of people, of communities, of our province. So the question is, you know, what is your gift? What, what has God blessed you with? Is it, is it the gift of hospitality? You know, you just have that gift of entertaining people. Maybe it's in your home, or maybe it's, you know, going to the coffee shop and just inviting someone to go along with you and spending time. Or maybe uh, it, it's, it's doing woodwork or, or some manual thing that God has blessed you with, and, and, and you are able to, um, to use those to bless others. Or, or maybe, it, maybe you have... The, the, the gift of organizing. God has blessed you with an organized brain, organized mind, and you can plant that. How are you using those gifts? Maybe it's the gift of music. And how are you using that to honor God and to bless people and to draw people into God's presence? What is the gift that God has given to you? And how are you using those gifts for the mission that he has given to us. Now, 
while all three of these areas, our time, talent, and treasure, is crucial, the third one often is the one that, um, that many people stumble over. Yes, what we do with our time tells me how much I'm committed and you are committed to the Lord. What I do with my talent, my abilities, tells me and tells you how much we're committed to God. But if you, if you really want to see where a person's commitment lies, look at what he does, he or she does with their treasure. Look, look at what they do with their treasure. Money, money represents, it's interesting, money represents a lot of things to different people. For, for some of us, money represents security, right? And every time I look at my retirement fund <laughs> these days, I think, oh man, there goes my security. <laughs> there goes the retirement fund. Um, so for, for many, it, it's about security. How, uh, you know, putting something aside for, for the future, making sure that I've got fine, and that's a good thing. That's a, that, that's a good thing to do. For, for many, it's, it rep, money represents the basic necessities of life. Food, clothing, shelter. And for many these days, this is an issue, right? Um, with the interest rates, who can afford a house these days to buy a new I fear for our young people, right? And, and, and so it, it, it's, it represents the basic needs. It seems like these days when you go to the, to the grocery store, you need to take out a mortgage. To, to buy the groceries, right, with inflation. So for many, it, it represents the basic needs of life. And, and then for, for others, money represents status. Keeping up with the Joneses. Making sure I got all the, the toys like everyone else does. But you know this verse, if you've been around the church a, a, a long time, here's what Jesus says about money. He says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So Jesus recognized this. And, and, and I, you know, you don't, I don't have to know someone very well. Um, if they, I'm not asking any of you to do this, but if, if they were, um, if they would allow me to look at their bank account, I could pretty much tell you what they're committed to, right? It, 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 uh, if, if I were to look at someone's bank account, uh, for someone, for one person, I could see that oh, family is a priority to this person. They spend a lot of their money making sure their family is well cared for, making sure their kids are, uh, are in good programs. And, and, and the likes. I, I could look at another person's bank account and, and it will tell me that they're all into sports. They will go to every basketball game or football, soccer, hockey game. That, that's, that's what their priority is. For another, I, I can tell that boy, travel is a huge thing for them. We love, my wife and I love traveling. And so, but for some people, that is their top priority is traveling. And for others, um, ministry is a top priority as you look at their bank account. But wh wh wherever it is that you place your money, this is G not me, this is Jesus saying, wherever it is that you place your treasures, there is where your priorities are, there is where your heart is. And so here's the truth that we need to understand. How you handle your resources is actually a spiritual matter. It's not just a money issue. More specifically, how generous I am and how generous you are with the resources that God has blessed you with is a spiritual matter. And here's what I mean. One of the ways that my wife and I, and I know many of us here, show that we honor God and that we put God first place in our lives is that we give 10% of what we earn 
to the ministry of the Lord. It comes right up for Pat and myself, it comes right off the top. Before we pay any other bills, we give to the ministry of the Lord. It comes right off the top. And I know that some people, maybe even some here, and I understand, would, would say, are you kidding me? 10%? That, that's a lot of money. Pastor Steve, you don't know the boss I have to put up with to make that money. You, you don't know the people I have to, you don't know how hard I have to work to earn that money. Listen, I, I get it. I understand it. I know that so, and sometimes I think that way, and I'm thinking, man, that 10%, you know how, what I could do with that? But whenever I start thinking that way, it seems to me that the Holy Spirit brings me back to stories like the one we read about the widow. <laughs> where, where we see in, in, in this widow someone who didn't just give 10%, she gave everything that she had. And you, have, you need to understand that widows in that time did not have much resources at all. If they didn't have family, they didn't have resources. It, it, and it seems that this widow had no children to care for her. Jesus himself describes her as poor. Destitute may be a better word to describe her. Remember, there was no social insurance back then. There was no old age security back then. All she had at this point in her life were two pennies. Two pennies. I mean, pennies. Pennies are so worthless to us, we don't even make pennies anymore. Well, what's, the, what's the largest? Do we have five cents pieces anymore? Yeah, okay. But pen, we don't even have them. But that's all she had, and she gave everything. There were others in the temple, the scripture tells us, who had lots more money and gave lots more money, but it was only a small portion of what they had. But for her, it, it, she gave everything. And so ultimately, the value of the gift is not determined by its amount, but by the spirit in which it is given. I, I thank God. That my parents, growing up in Belize, my parents, my dad was a pastor, my mom a, a nurse, very active in the ministry as well. But they taught us kids, the, uh, they taught us how to be generous. I mean, there, there, there were times, and I did, you know, growing up as a kid, you don't, you don't realize, you know, the, the worth of money, you don't realize the, the struggle maybe that your parents had financially. And it wasn't until I was older that I understood when I found out how, my, how much my dad used to make as a pastor um, and, and how much my mom made and combined. I'm thinking, boy, how in the world did they afford to keep us going? But they did. But they taught us right from an early age the spirit of generosity. They did not miss giving their offering, giving their tithes, and, and not only giving to the Lord, but helping people around them, helping our neighbors who were destitute. And, and, and they taught us at an early age. And you know what? God never, ever failed them in those days and throughout their lives. Dad went to be with the Lord a couple years ago during the COVID restrictions, and um, I, I think of him often. And one of the things I think about that is how generous he was to people around him. And, and, and God has never failed. I cannot remember a day where I was hungry. It doesn't look like I'm hungry now. Right? I, I, I can't ever remember a day where I didn't have clothes. I can't ever remember a day where I didn't have a shelter. You, you know the psalm. Where in Psalm 37 verse 25. I've never seen the godly abandoned. Or their children begging for bread. God takes care of those. Who make him the first priority in their lives. Uh, 
listen, what I'm going to share with you now is from our own experience, from my wife and I, our own experience, is not, please understand, this is not boasting. It is saying there was a point in our lives where we were going down the wrong path and God brought us back. Uh, but there was a time in our lives where money was tight. I mean, I was, um, I didn't have a job actually part of that time. Pat was working part time and, um, and, and we, money was tight. And so one of the first things that went out the window was giving our tithes and giving an offering to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit convicted us of that. And here is what we here is what we were sensing from the Holy Spirit. We had a, we had two vehicles. We had a car and we had a, a, a truck. And we were sensing from the Lord, you need to you need to sell that truck. And so we did. And we gave the money, the proceeds from that truck, to pay all to give all the back tithes that we had neglected to give. And you know what? We have never, ever since gone down that road again. We've let other things slide, but we have not allowed uh, our tithing to slide. And you know what? God has never, ever failed us. He never has. He never has. He has been faithful to us. He has blessed us. We're not rich people by any means. <laughs> We're not. But He has provided all that we need. <laughs> Uh, to accomplish what he has, uh, what he has tasked us with, and so the spiritual question is this: Why does God want me to give ten percent of my income? Let me quickly go through this. I know time is running away. Give a pastor a microphone; he just keeps going. Right? <laughs> but why, why does God want me to be generous? God, God wants us to understand, first of all, that everything belongs to Him anyway. <laughs> everything that we have belongs to Him. Look at what the Bible says in, in Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. That means all that I have, all that we have belongs to God. The house, the car, the it belongs to Him anyway. And we are trustees of the resources that God has given us charge over. That means that we are just holding it in trust for Him. And it all belongs to Him. And He, he actually allows Pat and myself to, to spend 90% of what He has entrusted to us. Here's another reason why God wants us to be generous. God wants us to build our faith in Him and not in our finances. Listen to what Malachi 3.10 says. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it, he says. Put me to the test. God says, test me. The only place in scripture where God says, test me. Put me to the test. And, and somehow God allows, God allows me and us to uh, stretch the 90% that he leaves us with further than the 100% would go. At least that's what we have found. And here's a final reason why God wants us to be generous. He wants us to be just like Him. Because He is a generous Father. All of us know the most uh, well-known verse in Scripture, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He what? He gave His own God. He gave, he gave his most prized possession, his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die a cruel death on the cross. And he did this so that we, you and I, could be saved. He, he did it out of his love and out of his 
generosity towards you and towards me. And here's what I want to close with. Spiritual lesson. You and I, we can never outgive God. We, we can't outgive Him in any aspect of our lives. We cannot outgive God. He, he, he promises that if we obey Him in, in this area of our life of surrendering our time, talent, and our treasure to Him, that He will pour out His blessing upon us. And, and you and I need to understand that when He blesses us, it's not for us to hoard, but it's for us to bless others around us with. And so let me ask the question that I ask myself. How committed am I to God in these areas of my life? What, what if God were to look at my portrait, time, talent, treasure, uh, what would he see in those areas of my life? I believe that God is looking for people, for committed followers of Jesus to make an impact on the 15 million people of Ontario, the thousands who are right in our area here in Petalong. Some of those people are family members of yours. Some of those people are co-workers of yours. Some of those people are neighbors of yours. How are we using our time, our talent, and our treasure to show the love of Jesus to the people around us? Are we spending time with them? Are we using our gifts and our talents to bless them? Are we using our treasures to help those who are in need to carry out the ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ? People of Ontario need Jesus. Here is my final thought. None of what we've talked about here this morning, none of what I have shared with you, we can do in and of our own strength. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit can we be the generous people, like the widow, that God is calling us to be. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, as we close this time together, I, I want to pray a prayer of God's blessing upon you. And that we would be a blessing to those around us as He blesses us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit would pour out your blessing upon us the Cedardale church family. You know the needs that are represented here. You know the individual and family needs that are represented here. You know the financial challenges that each person that sits here may be having. You know the financial challenges that families are going through these days. And so I pray that you would meet those needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that whatever other challenges people may be facing here, as we think about uh, the health challenges and the, uh, the relational challenges that, that some are going through, we pray, Lord, your blessing, your wisdom, your, uh, your, that you would uh, make a way where there seems to be no way in these situations. And Father, as we are blessed by you in whatever area of our lives you bless us. I pray that we in turn would be a blessing to those around us. I think about the, the verse in 2 Corinthians 1, I believe 3 and 4, where uh, it talks about your comfort. When we, are, when we are needing comfort, it says that you are a God of compassion who comforts us in our need so that we can comfort others in their times of need. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless us so that we would be a blessing to others in all the different areas of our lives. Father, bless Pastor Grant and Karen. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint them for the ministry that you have called them to. 
I pray that, the, that your power, the power of your Holy Spirit would be upon them. I pray, Lord, that, um, that they would see much fruit for their labor, that all the ministry leaders here in this congregation would see much fruit for their labor, and that many lives will be transformed because of the ministry that happens in and through the Cedardale Church of the Nazarene. We give you praise. You're an awesome God. And we love you. And we want to see people come to know you as their Savior through the ministry that you have given to us. We pray all of these things in the strong and precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.